welcome or welcome back to Twisted Minds. Today we're going to be talking about Richard Lee McNair, the man who has a legal record that would leave most professional criminals completely speechless. While you may not recognize his name, you've probably seen a video of Richard at least once or twice. In fact, a video of Richard blew up on YouTube, showing him smooth talking to a cop on the side of the road after he escaped from prison. Believe it or not, this cop caught Richard as he was running away in the local area, but Richard managed to convince the officer that he was a lowly jogger, just running about and getting his daily exercise. Put yourself in my position. Well, yeah, but I'm not. <laughs> I know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not you throwing you against her. Hey, you wouldn't believe what them guys do. I mean, they got years and years to think about how they're going to do it. I promise you, I'm not no damn prison escape baby. You'd have done run by now. <laughs> you know that yourself. <laughs> All right. I saw hey, a quick line there. Have a good day now. Be careful, buddy. Thank you. All right. Richard became somewhat of a household name after he managed to escape from prison. Not once, not twice, but three times. Let's just get right into it, shall we? Like most criminals his age, we don't know too much about Richard's earlier years. He's been described as a highly intelligent person, but we really don't know how he became this way. His father was once a reserve police officer, so it seems like Richard likely developed a keen understanding of the law from a very young age. His family and former friends haven't spoken about him too much over the years, but his brother seems to have had a soft spot for Richard and always looked up to him. In an interview that was released several years ago, his brother said, He's about the smartest person I've ever met. He was a good guy that I always admired, until he made bad choices. It's safe to say that Richard's family always held him very close, but his decisions led him down a dark path that forced his closest relatives to turn their backs on him. It would be great to learn more about his upbringing and about what led him to become such a savage criminal, but with so few details about his earlier years, all we're left with are guesses and snippets from interviews over the years. Richard's turning point in life came about in the late 1980s. He had been attempting a burglary in Minot, North Dakota. Minot isn't a city that you often hear about in the news. Considering its population currently sits at around 76,000 people, it's not the smallest town in the state, but it's certainly not the largest. But the town would be brought to its knees in November of 1987. Richard had broken into a building that stored grain and other valuables. He planned on robbing the building of any money or anything he could pawn or sell. All was going well at first, but Richard was soon caught in the act and was startled by two men that approached him from behind. Richard thought he had the robbery in the back, but the men did their best to disarm Richard and send him on his way. Sadly, things wouldn't blow over this easily. Richard opened fire on the two men, and one of the victims, Jerry Tease, lost his life at the hands of Richard. Another man was hit four times, but he managed to survive his injuries. At the time this crime took place, Richard had been leading a decent life and was a sergeant at the Minot Air Force Base. Considering one of Richard's victims survived the attack, it wasn't too difficult for police to track him down and bring him into questioning. The case was as cut and dry as they come. The firearm matched the one that had been used at the scene of the crime, so Richard was sent to trial for murder and attempted murder. A simple burglary went horribly wrong and claimed the life of one man and theoretically ended the life of Richard, as he would now be locked away for more than 30 years. However, Richard wasn't ready to give up just yet. Before Richard could even be sentenced, he had already begun working on his first escape plan to evade being locked up. Richard was at the Minot police station in 1988, just a short time after he had been arrested. At the time, police didn't consider Richard to be too great of a risk. After all, they'd caught the man responsible for the robbery and for the murder of Jerry Tees, and he was now handcuffed to a chair in an interrogation room. What could he possibly do while in police custody? Well, you'd be surprised. Richard remembered that he had a stick of lip balm in his pocket. 
He pulled the lip balm from his pocket and used it as a lubricant on his wrists. After getting his wrists as slippery as possible, he was able to pull his hands free from the handcuffs and slip away from the officers. But this isn't the most impressive part. According to some reports, police say that there were three detectives stationed near the room with Richard at the time he made his escape attempt. I'm not sure how all of this unfolded, but Richard managed to break out of the police station and led police on a chase for several blocks on foot. Police followed him all through town and eventually chased him up a stairwell and onto the third floor of a building. Police had him cornered, but Richard made a last-ditch effort to get away from the officers. He jumped from the third floor of the building and tried to grab a hold of a tree that was nearby. As fate would have it, he managed to grab the tree branch as he jumped, but the branch snapped. For a split second, Richard thought he had outsmarted the cops. However, as the branch gave way, Richard fell to the ground and landed on his back, seriously injuring himself. Police ran back downstairs and arrested him without incident on the ground. However, Richard was intent that this would not be how he met his end. Instead of serving his sentence and doing his best to get on the good behavior list for early release, Richard put up the fight of his life and began working on a plan to get himself out of prison. After Richard was released from the hospital following his back injury, he was sent to the Ward County Jail in Minot. He was put in a cell for a short time while officers worked on finding him a more permanent location inside the jail. He was relocated in February of 1988, and officers found that he had been working on chiseling out two of the concrete blocks inside of his cell. We don't know for sure what he planned on doing, but it seems pretty safe to assume that Richard had every intent on busting through the wall and escaping his cell. Jail workers obviously patched the wall and would keep a very close eye on Richard from here on out. It would be another four years before Richard thought about escaping again though this time, he would do so with the help of two other inmates. At some point along the way, Richard had been relocated to the North Dakota State Penitentiary in Bismarck, North Dakota. He was expected to stay in this prison for the majority of his sentence, but Richard had other plans. He and two other inmates concocted a classic plan of trying to escape prison through the air ducts. Let's just say that it wasn't easy, but Richard and his two accomplices managed to achieve their goal of breaking free. One of the inmates didn't have great luck after his escape. He was located and arrested just a few hours after he managed to break free. The other inmate managed to stay on the run for a few days, but police still managed to track him down quite quickly. Both of the men were sent back to prison and now faced additional charges and had extra time added onto their sentences. Richard, on the other hand, managed to outsmart police officers and would remain on the run for nearly a year. During this time, Richard grew out his hair and dyed it blonde. He managed to fool officers after changing his appearance and would travel all across the United States in the coming months, often traveling in stolen vehicles. Officers eventually caught on to him and managed to track him down to Grand Island, Nebraska. He was arrested once again and sent back through the court system once again. By 1993, Richard had been transferred to the Minnesota Correctional Facility near Oak Park Heights. He would remain here for several months before he realized that his chances of escaping this prison were essentially zero. Instead, he decided to participate in a sit-down protest, leading to him being apprehended once more and finally transferred to another prison in North Dakota before ultimately being sent to the Federal Bureau of Prisons. From here, he would be sent away to a maximum security prison to keep him from ever escaping again. Or so officers thought. More on that in a moment. At the end of it all, Richard was transferred once again to the United States Penitentiary in Pollock, Louisiana. He managed to be granted this transfer after requesting that he be sent closer to his parents' home in Oklahoma. Now that Richard had been moved to yet another prison, he once again had a chance to devise another plan. While living at the prison, Richard was allowed to work in the manufacturing area. He would work on many different projects in this area, but one of his most popular tasks was repairing torn mailbags. 
These bags would be used to bring mail into the prison and distribute it to all the prisoners, staff, and guards. Richard came up with a crazy ploy to create what he called an escape pod. This escape pod was nothing more than a large box that had been shrink-wrapped to a pallet. However, Richard thought of everything so that he could make sure that he would not only escape prison, but also survive his journey. He went as far as to install a breathing tube in his so-called escape pod and waited for the package to be delivered outside of the prison. When mail day finally rolled around, Richard hopped inside the box just before it was shrink-wrapped. After a while, the package was picked up and taken outside of the prison walls to an unsecured area. After the box was delivered, Richard waited inside for quite some time, until the prison workers in this area took their lunch break. While they were gone, Richard cut himself free and ran away to freedom. He used the next few hours to flee on foot to Alexandria, Louisiana. Once he got here, he planned on stealing a large number of supplies that would help him live out the next few days on the run. This is where things get super interesting. Remember the video in which Richard Smooth talked his way out of a conversation with an officer in Louisiana? This is where that footage comes into play. As Richard was running away from the prison several hours after his escape, officers in the surrounding area were put on high alert that a potentially armed and dangerous prisoner was now on the run. An officer stopped Richard as he was jogging near a railroad track in Ball, Louisiana. Officer Carl Bordelon spoke with Richard and asked him for his name. Thinking quickly, Richard gave him the name of Robert Jones. He didn't have any identification on him, but the officer didn't think too much about it. He radioed into headquarters and asked for a better description of the criminal. The description that the station provided matched Robert's description perfectly, but the officer still didn't raise too many questions. Robert, aka Richard, told the officer that he was just out on his daily jog. The officer asked where he lived, but Robert was unable to give him an address. Instead, he said he'd been living in a nearby hotel while working on a construction project. He claimed that he'd been helping build roofs on nearby buildings that had been torn apart during Hurricane Katrina, one of the most destructive and deadly hurricanes in the early 2000s. Just a few minutes later, the officer asked Robert for his name once again. This is where things nearly fell apart as he replied that his name was Jimmy Jones. Though the officer didn't catch this small mistake. Instead, he let Jimmy go and Richard was free once more. Officer Carl Bordelon later defended himself and explained that the description that the local police station provided for Richard was completely different from how this man, supposedly named Robert, looked. This was blamed on Richard's prison photo being more than six months old and being incredibly low quality. Even though Bordelon spent 10 minutes speaking with Richard, he said that Richard seemed completely calm and collected and he had no reason to believe he was an escaped criminal. The officer was not reprimanded for letting Richard go and he remained with the police department up until his death in 2015. Richard was later asked about this close call with Officer Bordelon, and Richard said that, while he was completely shocked that the officer let him go, he certainly had agreed that his prison photos didn't look anything like him anymore, and said that he completely understood why the officer was blissfully unaware of what Richard had been doing on the train tracks that day. After Richard was allowed to run free from Louisiana, he would spend the next few months traveling all around the United States. He eventually made his way north and entered Canada through a route in Washington. He would leave Canada and return several times over the next few months, before eventually finding enough materials and technical know-how to produce a fake ID from Alaska. This ID allowed him to live a somewhat normal life albeit in solitude, and helped him remain on the run for many more months. He made a living by stealing new cars from dealers, as well as any cash that may have been unsecured. He had formerly worked at a car dealer, so he knew the ins and outs of the business and knew where to find both the money and the keys. He would remain on the run, jumping in and out of Canada, until October of 2008. An off-duty police officer passed by Richard on the road one day and noticed that the rear windows of his van were poorly tinted. 
The officer felt that this was likely done to hide the contents of the van and felt as though the driver may have been smuggling alcohol or cigarettes. The officer phones in the report to a local station and it wouldn't be long before another rookie officer would notice the van traveling through a downtown area. The officer followed the van and, once pulled over, promptly arrested Richard after realizing who he was. Once he was in custody, Richard reportedly had a great time with the officers. He joked with them and had normal conversations. Richard would later describe the officers as good men doing their job. At the end of it all, Richard would be extradited to the United States and is currently serving out the remainder of his sentence at ADX Florence, one of the most highly secured prisons in the world. Richard is not allowed to use the internet and all of his mail is carefully screened by prison guards. It's unlikely that Richard will ever be able to escape again.